Welcome back to Trending in Education. Dan Schreffer, Mike Palmer along with you, and we are closing out or starting to close out the 2019 year of episodes by looking back at the year that was. We're going to be using an Edutopia article, a great one that looks back at research in 2019 as a foundation. But first and foremost, always like to check in. Mike, how are you doing as 2019 comes to a close? I'm doing wonderfully well, Daniel. And uh, thank you for asking. Uh, it's been a nice year. It's a nice year. Uh, and years with nines in them are interesting because they it's like the odometer is about to turn over. So like you kind of you kind of want to savor it a little bit. Uh, that was a reference to the way car uh, odometers used to operate before they went digital. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's like the turning of a page, you know, the end of a chapter, uh, both for the year and then when it's a nine year, it's uh, it's time to look back on 10 years. And then I think we're going to start looking forward, not just one year, but also maybe trying to look ahead for 10 years. So like it's an interesting, uh, it's the most it's felt like this to me since 1999 is like, you know, like you're entering into a new phase. You're looking at a big chunk of time that is passing and then something new is on the horizon. So like, I think that feeling is, uh, it's kind of like in the air, Dan. Uh, and, uh, and then it's interesting at the same time to kind of focus uh, a little more closely on the year in research, uh, which is what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, Yuki Tirada, uh did a really nice job, uh, I think outlining the major findings in uh, educational research uh, over the course of 2019. and. Uh, it is just a reminder that uh, people are doing the, the the really hard work of science like every every day, uh, and a lot of work goes into what turns into a few paragraphs in an article like this, and maybe a conversation uh, that you and I have. But um, but it is it is um, impressive to look at the the breadth of research that's emerging. Uh, and it's really a credit to the people who do that type of work uh, and also folks uh, like Yuki who are, are writing up these things. Uh, but then uh, I think it's, it's, it's super interesting for us as a trend spotting show to kind of see what is the actual peer reviewed research saying. And obviously there's more than just this, but these were the, the, the most newsworthy educational research uh, findings uh throughout 2019 so uh so i thought it, it was uh it's a nice way to sort of reflect back on the year uh so i don't, I don't know how you wanted to break it down dan but uh but yeah i'm, do, I'm doing uh, wonderfully well well i, I do want to uh, take a self-congratulatory lap here in a, in a sense because a lot of these topics that are listed in this article are topics we've touched on throughout the year and hit on as the research came out or we've talked about doodling in the past which is one yeah. of the mentions here we've talked about uh the access gaps we've talked about things throughout the year the summer slide was something yeah. we hit on as well so i do think as a trend spotting show a little bit of a grading here uh, good to see our our topics match up with what uh, this author has put together uh, yeah. and that we're staying on top of those things but oh uh, i don't know if we did we did we go like 10 for 10 like what was our, what was our hit rate you know I, that's I, I think we're batting over 300 which okay. is all i care about but i, I think yeah. Yeah. We are starting to talk about, uh, we've, we've talked, uh, let's see, scroll, 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 scroll. All right, we, we've hit on, I would say half, I, right. I would say is, is about right. Uh, right. There are some in here that we will hit on in the next year, and to Mike's point, are really starting to be even more forward thinking, not just the year to come, but the next 10 years, 20 years in education, uh, and looking with a, maybe a wider lens at what could be happening in learning. But Mike, I, I think, one, 2019 has research that maybe debunks things from 2010 and education and learning is a, a science or research field that is ever changing. And we're learning new things each and every year that can prove or help out uh, new things uh, for students and for online learners. But the one that I do love here at the top is the idea of doodling versus yeah. drawing. And we've talked about doodling before and we talked about the idea of, and I like the distinction in this study of defining what they are. So often we use words interchangeably that maybe aren't properly vetted or properly used. And here in this article and also in the research, the difference between drawing your notes, being yeah. trying to think through it and doodling something completely unrelated on the side of your, your notebook are clearly two different things, but are often used almost as synonyms. Yeah. 
And there might be a blurry line or a fine line or a line you could erase between those two things, uh, depending on how you want to define a doodle. You know, how on topic does the drawing have to be uh, for it to be a drawing and not a doodle? I'm not exactly sure, but uh, but it, yeah, it's super, super uh, thought provoking. Thing, a thought provocative, uh, if that's a thing, uh, that um, is almost like the the output of what you do with your hand, the actual physical activity is very similar, but the impact on learning is very different depending on uh, the context and how it relates to um, what you're trying to uh, encode for yourself. So um, reminded me a little bit of when we were talking about uh, memory palaces as well, where like there are, or cognitive hacks is another thing that, that I like to talk about, where like there are lots of um, tactics that are effective learning tools and there are cognitive scientists, cognitive psychologists, neuroscientists, people who are researching this, social psychologists, sociologists, the list literally goes on and on. Uh, they're all doing uh, the professional work uh, to document how brain function, uh, cognitive function relates to uh, behaviors like drawing. And uh, it is interesting how you can even begin to isolate um, the um, these sort of mental models that exist in the, in the learner. Uh, I think it's a I think it's super, super fascinating. Plus we talk all the time about the picture superiority effect, the idea that like visual right. inputs are, um, you know, they, they access different brain centers, uh, they deepen the processing and uh, help you uh, consolidate and remember things better. Um, and we live in such a visual age, particularly around social media, you know, um, uh, and we talk a lot about making things you know so like you know be a creator be a drawer uh is an interesting um you know call to action uh and uh yeah i wonder i wonder how good the doodles are too you know like so, I, I, that's exactly where i was gonna go trade-offs right so like if if by virtue of your doodling you become a cartoonist um or an animator um what were you not learning yep. uh, while you were making something pretty good, or at least, you know, upskilling yourself for, for future work. Uh, it's an interesting question. Yeah, I thought we could maybe just, you know, sort of lightning round through them all, Dan, but uh, other thoughts on the, the doodling versus drawing? That's right where I was as well, the quality over quantity of doodles and, and does that matter? And, and do we maybe encourage people who might say they're not good artists or not good drawers to attempt to draw their notes or draw what they're hearing and how does that play in all of it but more studies to come I'm happy to to quickly run through absolutely yeah uh, just one other thing on the doodling one though too is like it is a um it is a cautionary note to teachers too like if if everybody in your class is doodling you may want to work a little harder to get them on task and this is an interesting note too where you could say listen for those of you who are interested in drawing uh, research has shown that you're going to understand what I'm talking about better if you're drawing your if you're drawing your notes rather than purely writing them, uh, and you know even encouraging your class to be creative about what you're drawing to help consolidate your memory, and then uh, ideally you know walk around the room have people show their work. So I think there's there's ways to kind of like model. Uh, what's okay uh, to also help unlock the creativity of your class. Um, so, so I was really happy um, that uh, that they let off with this one because because uh, there's quite a few, you know. So I thought we could uh, just about at this pace, whatever pace you think makes sense. But I think we try to get through the whole list yep. uh, without going too terribly long. Yeah. Yes, uh, awards don't boost attendance. Teachers do. I would love to say, well, common sense, you know, great teachers and teachers caring about their students will boost students wanting to be in the classroom. I think we've seen this, the whole student, the whole teacher movement. We've talked about that many times over here on the podcast, but the idea of having a caring, involved teacher in the classroom will want students to come, giving them a star on a sticker chart or perhaps a pen from a pen box or a, a squishy of some sort, uh, doesn't seem to resonate the same way that the teacher being involved and caring does. Uh, for the student wanting to come to school. Yeah, and it sounded like that that extended to like, did they call uh, to follow up about the student who wasn't showing up? So like, was there a genuine effort 
uh, to, to understand the student in, in her own shoes, you know? So like, you know, is there an attempt to, um, to be present in a human way or, uh, or is it more transactional, you know? So like the idea that the teacher wanted you there, uh, is is more of an incentive it reminds me of the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic rewards or you know social emotional versus um sort of monetary or uh you know extrinsic uh stuff you know but uh it it the flip side i thought was what was maybe a little more interesting and they didn't go into depth uh i'd like to dig in a little further into the research but um was that the extrinsic rewards, giving a star or giving a pen or giving whatever uh, to folks who attend uh, perfect attendance, they said that could also backfire. So like I started thinking about what those backfires might look like. And uh, I think part of it might be once you can't get perfect, you're like, well, screw it. You know, like why even show up? And then also like there is a little bit of like, oh, look at, look at uh, little Mr. Perfect over there, perfect attendance. I'm gonna sit in the back of the class and uh, and be a little cooler than that. Uh, I don't need your little gold star, you know. So, so do you want to create that kind of dynamic versus I want to know you and your family, and I want to make sure when you don't make it into class, I'm asking about that. Um, but that also made me think about like how do we give teachers the bandwidth to do that type of outreach, particularly when their class sizes get big. They don't necessarily have a good number or a good way to reach their their kids, and uh, and that even just the teachers themselves are burnt out. You know, do they have the time, um, particularly when it, when there's bigger absentee rate? You know, higher more absenteeism. That means more calls. Right. That means more families to get to know. So it's sort of like, you know, it's like a tipping point problem. Like once too many of your students are having attendance problems. I think even the good practices here are not enough. So I don't think it's exclusively, uh, you know, on the teacher to manage this outreach, right. but it is a reminder that probably the best way to, to have engaged students is to have engaged teachers. Yep. And I would agree with that. And I think uh, as it discusses further, just the, the engagement in the classroom itself too, like, the, you know, not necessarily the absence, but just being an engaging teacher, I would anecdotally say the teachers I remember best are the ones that cared about me most, not the ones that yeah. necessarily were the best teachers the mo that I learned most from, but the ones that did seem to care more and were more engaged with my life and what was going on even outside the classroom. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. um, I love the next uh, topic in, in the way they phrase it. Math circuitry looks the same in boys and girls. Yeah. So a study here, uh, three to 10 year old, 104 students. How does the brain work when dealing with math and conclusions drawn that math, you know, work is largely societal, that the difference between boys and girls isn't based on brain chemistry or the way we're wired, but much more just simply how society has put constructs around. Socially, socially constructed, Dan, you know, I'm a, I'm a social psychology guy back, back from back in the day. So, uh, Social, social constructivism is an interesting idea, but it's the idea that like a lot of um, things that we feel are uh, innate, you know, natural ways in which humans think about things, talk about things, engage with each other, are actually uh, created through our uh, social interactions, our society and our culture. And uh, it's a pretty deep idea, but, um, you know, the interesting thing in this article about, you know, you know, the, the gender gap around math, which is the sort of stereotype in the US, um, some of that is reinforced, you know, those culture, those, those stereotypes can actually reinforce uh, the biases that they're, that, that they're not actually, uh, that, that, that there's no truth to. Um, and uh, I think that in fact may, may have been the case uh, in the US uh, you know, the, the whole trope of the Barbie that says math is hard, uh, you know, is kind of like, talk about zeitgeisty, like that actually, that's been around, like that, that story has been around for like 40 years now. But, um, but it's really interesting in the, in the, the flip side is also true that like in some Scandinavian countries, it's always Scandinavia, but in some Scandinavian countries, uh, the gender uh, relations to uh, math it, are reversed, you know, so, you know, the, the stereotype there is that girls are better at math. And it is interesting that 
you know, once that stereotype is out there, then uh, the research starts to back it up. And um, it is tricky. It's a little bit of a chicken egg thing. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we all need to be on guard about like, um, like bias and stereotyping and particularly in the ways that it's limiting, um, in the ways that it's, um, you know, helps people thrive. I think, I think that can be good. You know, that's where you'd almost want to tell both girls, you know, girls, you tell girls that they're great at math and then you tell boys that they're also great at math. Right. You know? So, uh, it's although, un- yeah, although, uh, you tell them they're working hard, right? Like you don't, you don't tell them they're great at math. It's very difficult. You know, all this educational research, like what are we supposed to do with it? How do we keep it straight? Well, I got one answer. You listen to training and education. Right? There you go. I was going to say you put a sheet of paper and leave the room and see what happens when you come back, but, um, probably not the best way to go about teaching. I will say, uh, what you mentioned about studies and self-fulfilling prophecies is to an extent I've used that before where you sort of will something to an, into existence simply by saying over and over again, it's going to happen. The next topic up, uh, the idea of the summer slide, I think talks about research and how one piece of research being quoted again and again and again, isn't necessarily solved science, right? right? It's not that this is done. It's just that people found a piece of data that works for a narrative they want to tell. And, yeah, I was a journalism student for a while. I, I worked as a journalist, but when you find a fact, it works a lot of the times to use it when you're writing a story. And if you don't do the extra research to see what backs it up, we have research like this, the summer slide, which we talked about on the podcast this past summer, is the idea that why do students come back not as prepared and the study was flawed. The, the study was flawed and, and didn't really have context, didn't really have a good pool of data. Right. And now we're seeing new studies unable to replicate that data. Right, right. Right. Well, it's also, I mean, there's a bias towards uh, interesting findings, right? And then, so like you don't, you know, there's not a lot of headlines like, you know, Dan and Mike's research confirmed the null hypothesis. There is actually no difference. Right. The, 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 the hypothesis was disconfirmed. You know, like nobody cares about that. But like when something new and noteworthy emerges, particularly if it has narrative elements, I think frequently it crosses over into more like mainstream media, mainstream perception. And that's frequently where it's flawed. That's where lots of times pop psychology, pseudoscience, those kinds of things uh, kick in because then it becomes more like the realm of lore where like, you know, you hear a story and then you tell that story again. And that's really, that's kind of what humans have evolved to do. Like we're natural storytellers, we're myth makers, and we, uh, we spend a lot of time talking to each other. So a lot of that isn't involves telling uh, stories. The challenge is sometimes those uh, narratives are more powerful than the scientific evidence. And, you know, the Zimbardo study was the other one that um, recently went through a similar um, uh, retrospective where it's this classic study out of Stanford uh, where uh, a bunch of uh, volunteers were identified either as uh, prisoners or guards. And then they ran through like a simulated experience for I think it was a few weeks and uh you know notoriously the the guards became increasingly uh abusive sadistic and uh and then the 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 prisoners uh you know became more prisoner mentality but a lot of that research of late uh was sort of debunked you know so um research that becomes prevailing uh frequently is then replaced by subsequent research and uh just a reminder that uh you know science is only true based on what we know today and things that we believe to be true today uh, may be disproven in the future. And, uh, you know, you just have to be comfortable having some flexibility in your thinking and also being critical about new findings, you know, just because something is new and noteworthy doesn't necessarily mean the science is incontrovertible and it'll never be revisited in the future. Actually, the opposite, the opposite is probably true where like there, there will be uh, a better understanding this of this based on future research and false positives do happen. So, um, you know, um, yeah. So, so I thought that one was, uh, that one was kind of cool. Uh, the summer slide also sounds like a dance, right? Yes. Like you need to do your version of the electric slide more about learning over the summer and call it the summer slide. So uh, send us your videos. If you're, uh, if that, you're doing that. there's, there's our TikTok entry. That's yes. where it is. Get the TikTok account going. There it is. Uh, there, there it is. What Follow else they got here, Dan? They got cut the arts at your own risk. 
makes sense to me uh, as a art student growing up. Uh, I, I am very much behind the arts, but saying that grades go up when uh, arts are added and when arts are a focal point of uh, different uh, schools and, and different administrations, uh, that student reading goes up and, and other pieces of their educational output. So I, I can't say I'm surprised by this, but I do like to see that the research is still happening and yep. that the findings are being shared. So yeah, uh, no real yeah, surprise there. And uh, you know, it's also a reminder that, you know, as the future work is going to be evolving, like spending more time with the arts, understanding how to make things, uh, how to be a musician, be an actor, be a performer, um, those are likely going to continue to be meaningful, viable career paths as humans. So uh, developing programs that encourage that is good. And then there was some discussion here about how that, it helps with uh, the executive functions of, uh, of the kid's brain um, to, uh, to think about how to perform at that level, which, um, which I actually think is an interesting insight as well. I've always thought about that as, um, you know, look, looking back on my, my test prep experience, like when you're taking a test, you're expected to perform at a high level and uh, almost reminds me of like good athletes, good musicians, uh, good performers, um, I think have a way to self-regulate and understand themselves uh, to kind of dial things in and giving people an opportunity to do that, not just in an athletic context or in an academic context, context but also in an artistic context. Uh, I think it's hugely important, and I think it's an important counterpoint to um, the risk of being over-indexed on STEM. Uh, it's why, you know, STEAM, you know, put the A in STEAM to, to bring the arts into play. You know, this would certainly encourage uh, that type of thinking. Next up is the idea of uh, students with disabilities, uh, learning disabilities, physical disabilities, the importance of one early intervention uh, getting in there as early as possible to understand uh, what help they need in the classroom, at home, with their learning on a regular basis. But also, I will say probably the, uh, to use the word scary, the disappointing point here is the second paragraph from, from the article from Edutopia is that only 17% of teachers say they feel adequately trained by their certification programs, according to a new report. And that means teachers aren't prepared to help these students. And that is obviously a failing as well as uh, students with special needs uh, become more widespread in classrooms, more uh, classrooms that are inclusive rather than specific special ed classrooms. Some teachers just are not prepared to handle those, those uh, students. And that's, that's got to change. Like that's obviously a teacher training fact and, and they yeah. need to find a way to, to make sure they're ready to teach all the students in their classroom uh, as best as they can. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And there's more, um, related topics, uh, I think, uh, throughout the, the rest of this article. So like we would, we would really encourage uh, folks to, to take a look at Yuki Tirada. Yuki, we may reach out to you, try to get uh, more perspective around the type of educational research that's powering this. This is from, uh, from Edutopia, uh, which is a good follow uh, on Twitter um, and elsewhere. But, uh, but yeah, I think, you know, maybe we can cherry pick any others that, that jump out at uh, either or both of us, Dan. But, um, but it does make me think that uh, this type of research is the type of thing we should be covering more, uh, more regularly, I think, on the show uh, and figure out how to give it its due maybe with the researchers themselves. So like one thing that I think we did a nice job of, but I'd love to do more of, is actually bringing the researchers into the conversation um, the other thing I'd love to do more heading into next year is bring the bring in some educators uh, who are, you know, maybe aware and using some of these interventions based on this type of research, but also educators who haven't seen this research before go through a list like this and say, all right, well, you know, you teach eighth grade. Um, what do you think about these findings? Which of them ring true? Which of them are surprising? Uh, which of them might, uh, might change your behavior uh, moving forward? Um, cause I do think those, uh, bias loops that we were talking about, uh, they can even happen in terms of the type of research that gets published, you know, so absolutely. Uh, what, uh, what else jumps out, jumps out at you though, Dan? Uh, yeah, I don't think we necessarily need, there's a lot. I was reading right. the whole yeah. list and I was like, this is going to take a little while. Well, so, uh, I, 
I would say as a fan of sleep, the research from Seattle is great that more sleep for students leads to better grades. I again think that's been sort of a prevailing wisdom thing that get them more sleep where you can. Uh, I will also point out, talks about growth mindset. We've talked about many times here on the show uh, that a little bit maybe of the the Gartner hype cycle there, that it went through uh, a little bit of trough of disillusionment, but coming back out the other side, the the growth mindset. And I see it a lot. I've talked about it many times in in my daughter's school, not the, the whole idea of I can't do this yet. Um, but I think that's a, 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 an idea and term that will stick with us into the near future. I don't think it's going anywhere uh, quite yet. Yeah. Yeah. And just to round it out, I guess a couple other ones here. Fewer warnings for, for black students. So that's around uh, discipline for black uh, middle, middle school students uh, relative to their white peers. Um, fewer warnings are give, given to black students before their uh, discipline somehow uh, sent to the principal's office uh, than white students. Getting back to that same stereotype, um, stereotyping challenges that exist everywhere. Um, that's one that I would love to understand what types of interventions are being tried to, to correct for this. Like, is it just talking about it um, elevates awareness or are there like new ways to train or, um, you know, break out of the implicit bias uh, problem? Uh, we still, probably could do a little more follow up on how that's happening in the corporate world too. Uh, you know, thinking back on the Starbucks, um, uh, diversity training, uh, you know, after their incident in Philadelphia that we covered a bit. Um, and then there's one other here, I guess, uh, on paper beats screens, uh, says a new study, but read the fine print. Uh, and this is, uh, an education professor at university of North Dakota, Virginia Clinton analyzed, uh, I guess it's a meta-analysis of 33 studies and found that uh, children and adults tend to remember more when they read on paper than on a digital device. Uh, But the important caveat there is that it's almost like a a very uh, slimmed down digital device to make it exactly comparable. So like no no hyperlinks, no additional functionality, uh, no access to media, like all the things you can do in a digital format were not provided. So like as a pure, um, you know, flat eye reading experience, uh, print uh, appears to work better based on this uh, meta analysis. And, uh, you know, I got to say print's pretty resilient. I don't think it's going anywhere. You know, like, uh, it's kind of like Mark Twain uh, back in the day, reports of print's death are, uh, are greatly exaggerated. Like, I think we're always going to want to have something to hold on to. Yep. Uh, It'll just be interesting as, um, as the digital gets increasingly uh, deep and immersive and feature rich, is there a point at which it's better than the, the pure uh, print experience? Um, and then there's also the benefit of just being off screens. Like, is there a different um, sort of like neurological state uh, that kicks in when no screens are engaged and uh, not to play the, the parent of a young child card too much, but uh, but I definitely see it in Matthew. Like anytime there's a screen anywhere in the room that is activated, he's drawn to it like a moth to a flame. Yep. And I think it's a little bit like a moth to a flame too. So like I'm not expecting expecting that to get any easier. That and remote controls. But uh, but that's uh, that's a whole nother uh, kettle of fish. When you uh, put the remote control on the screen, oh yeah, that's when all bets are off. Yeah. They can't. Yeah, they yeah. can't. It's like the desensitization. You just put them in a room full of remotes. It's I, great to see what he does. Crawling through it. Um, I will say, I always was taught that uh, paper beat rock, but yeah. I guess it beats screen as well. Uh, but beyond that. Yeah, I do think uh, the interesting point here is that they took out all of the benefits of the screen, right? The the idea of clicking links and getting the extra yeah. media and getting so what that comparison to your point is. And something that doesn't come up here, I did click through and see research. You always want to know who's you know sponsoring the research. See, right. see the base of why someone is asking these questions, right. where the research is coming from. This is more in consumer products to me than education and learning. Uh, right. But understand who's putting that research out there, why they're doing it, what they're questions were and why that is out there. I think it's important. Right. We'll talk about it more in 2020. Yeah, well, and, and I think on that point too, in the academic space, like, you know, people gen- generally don't mind going down a rabbit hole every so often, but like understand when you read like a survey of academic research like this, 
there's frequently uh, an entire body of work that is presenting both this and an, and one or more alternative understandings of it. And this is the latest science. So this is what is, you know, now needs to be replicated. And, uh, you know, it's easy for uh, academic research to kind of just be treated as uh, almost like a surface fact when, when, when you go a little deeper, you understand there's still uncertainty there. Um, and, uh, you know, that being said, like, I, I, I love that, uh, all of this is condensed into one place, uh, and, uh, with hyperlinks, uh, just to, to your point there, Dan, so that if you want to go deeper into the original research, or if you want to look at, uh, supporting things, it's all there within, uh, within this Edutopia article. And, um, we'd love to hear more, uh, both from researchers who are, uh, presenting learning findings like these, uh, and then also from folks who are uh, communicators, journalists, uh, writers, uh, just people who are playing with their head up. If you see anything that you think would be relevant uh, to folks who are trying to understand how to learn better, uh, we'd love to use this, uh, this podcast as an opportunity to, to sort of showcase and highlight uh, new and surprising stuff. And uh, yeah, it's, this, it's been a fun year, Dan, right? Uh, this yeah. is our... Uh, this is our, our one of our last shows of uh, 2019. Looking forward to 2020. Uh, any uh, any parting thoughts as we as we wrap it up? A year of uh, some transitions and some more to come in 2020. Some things uh, on the up and up, looking like uh, continued growth for the podcast itself. So selfishly looking forward to that next year. Uh, and I echo Mike's, if you are researching, if you're a teacher who has found some of this research and have tried to implement it in your classroom, we'd love to hear from you as well. You don't even have to necessarily come on as a guest. Just tell us how it's going. Give us some background information. We'd love to be able to talk about that here in 2020. Uh, we're going to start looking ahead so much and trying to shape some of these topics. Uh, really with uh, Mike's work and Mike's research out there, getting in touch with some great people as well uh, in the community. So look forward to talking to more and more folks uh, as the year goes on. So really excited about what 2020 has in store. We do have prediction shows coming up and uh, look ahead uh, as well. So with that said, we really appreciate each and every one of you listening to Trending in Education. Find us on Twitter at Trending in Ed. Same on Facebook. LinkedIn is linkedin.com slash Trending in Education, a great place for these discussions. And of course, it's Trending in Education.com. Until next time, thanks for listening to Trending in Education.